Hello, and welcome to the MS for Mama podcast. I'm your host, Abby Halberstadt, happy wife, mama to 10, Bible-believing Christian. And today we're going to talk about the concept of giving each of our children the kind of love and attention that they crave, knowing that they are seen and heard and cared for is so important to kids. And one of the main questions that I get asked every single week when I do What Do You Want to Know Wednesday on Instagram, which is a weekly Q&A that I do, is... How do you pay enough attention to your children? You have so many. I only have three and I feel like I struggle to divide my attention equally, to give them what they need. Kids are always wanting me to read with them, play with them, um, spend time with them, lie down with them to go to sleep. And I just feel pulled in so many different directions. So how do you do that with 10 kids? And I'm going to delve into some very specific answers and give you some really practical suggestions for ways to be successful in making connections with your kids, regardless of the number that you have, regardless of their personalities. But one thing I want to start with is this um, brief tidbit of encouragement. I think that we make this too complicated. And what I mean by that is this. We have come to understand that quality time with children means something spectacular. It means pony rides and cotton candy and trips to the zoo and ice cream and one-on-one dates and sleepovers and stay up nights and all kinds of things that are wonderful and good and can be great ways to connect with our children on an occasional basis, but aren't sustainable in day-to-day life. So what I think people are usually asking me is, how do I make this connection and how do I keep that kind of tenuous cord tethered throughout extracurriculars, making dinner every night, nursing a baby, being up with a toddler that refuses to go to sleep at a normal hour, um, being up later with teenagers, being up early when my husband goes to work. We have all of these pressures and things that pull on us. And many of them are very good things. It's not like we are complaining necessarily even about the demands on our time because we know that so many of the things in life that we are doing to serve our family, to um, to be present in our community, to connect with people at church, to take care of our elderly family members, those are all good things from the Lord. But it does make us feel a little bit like stretched taffy. And so... What are some practical ways that we can approach connecting with our children that will make us feel stretched even more thinly? Um, So when I say that I think that we make it more complicated than it has to be, I feel like that's a lot of societal pressure. Um, Some of it comes from changes in circumstances in the way that we live our lives as families. The nuclear family doesn't look exactly like it did 100 years ago, certainly, um, or even 50 years ago. And so when we look at where we're going to find the time when we have the ability and sometimes almost we think the obligation to pile on extracurriculars that maybe we didn't used to have access to, um, the convenience of quick meals, the convenience of TV in the background. And by convenience, I mean, it's so easy to turn on that necessarily that it provides us with anything terribly convenient other than entertainment. And it's so easy to push past some really obvious opportunities for connection that I think used to be um, used to be expected, used to be the norm. So when we're thinking about how to take back some of these chances to make those make those bonds with our children, we have to start being honest about how we're spending our time. Uh, I'm a homeschool mom and I am home most days all day with my children. So sometimes the joke that I make is that I get to cheat. It's not cheating at all. It's a lot of work, but I get to cheat with making connections with my children because even though I have 10 of them, because I'm home with them, uh, most moments of most days, we are able to have so many different touch points of communication and connection throughout the day that it doesn't usually strike me as being so very difficult to have good moments with each one of them throughout the day that makes them feel seen and loved. But I've had to make sure that my perspective is understanding that those moments count, 
that when I put my toddler in my lap and we read a book together, that that counts. That when I invite a kid to come over and help me with dinner, that that counts. That when, um, when I sit down and I have a fun conversation with my teens after my littles are in bed and I might rather um, go get in a hot bath or go answer some emails that I've been putting off all day, but I spend 30 minutes instead playing a game of cards with them or just listening to them tell me about their days, um, that that counts. So when I say, again, that we have overcomplicated things and we have tried to open our day books and our planners and say, okay, when can I schedule time with Shelly? When can I schedule time with Michael? When can I make sure that, um, you know, whoever, insert any name, feels loved? Instead, we could take a moment and say, where are the, um, where are the moments Where are the gaps? Where are the open slots in my day-to-day interactions with my kids where instead of turning to my phone, instead of turning the TV on, instead of turning to um, a convenience meal, instead of turning to yet another activity and saying yes to something that maybe will make us crazier and draw us farther apart, we instead start making good yes choices and good no choices to say, this is cluttering up our schedule. This is making us busier and more harried than we need to be. We need breathing space for our family to find those pockets of communication and connection. And we won't have them unless we are really intentional with our time. So if we are being intentional with our time, those pockets as they pop up are opportunities to say, I see you and I am welcoming you into this moment of my life. So as a busy mama that cooks most of our meals in the evenings at home, um, some of our breakfasts I cook, we kind of have a family free for all for lunch, but we're all in the same kitchen together, making our own lunches and chatting together. Um, As a busy mama who homeschools and needs to cover a lot of different grades and different different subjects in a day as a baby busy mama who also does some outside work that I that I do from home there I have to answer emails as a busy mama who loves spending time with my husband and wants to be able to go on a weekly date with him and to be able to give him my full attention when he needs to tell me something or when we're just sitting down at the end of the day to chat I want to be really intentional with recognizing that if I'm going to connect with each member of my family in a meaningful way on a on a daily basis, I'm going to have to keep my ears and my eyes open for opportunities. So if we said no to unnecessary distractions, if we've said, you know what, we're not going to have two different extracurricular activities for every child because that would make us insane and we would never see each other. We're going to protect our time in the evenings to have dinner together. Um, three to five times a week, which is what our family shoots for and reaches at this point, even with teenagers in the house, even with um, a wide age range and a lot of kids. That's just something that we've chosen to protect and guard and make a uh, family tradition in our home. And I'm so grateful for it because it gives us so many good opportunities for conversation. It gives us an opportunity for a slower meal where we're not constantly eating out of takeout carriers or, you know, trying to stuff a burger in our mouths while we drive to the next event in the car. Um, so family dinner for us is really big, but that may not be the answer that you're looking for when you're thinking about how do you connect with each child individually. So when I say I, I need to be aware, first I need to make those yeses and those noes and pray over those and have those discussions with my husband so that we can have those free pockets. And then when those pockets pop up, I need to be willing to give up my own comfort sometimes for the sake of listening to what my child has to tell me. So a very, very easy suggestion. Uh, I do a lot of my grocery shopping through grocery pickup at this point, but we have a little grocery about five minutes from our house. And so if we're out of something and I didn't have it on the pickup order, we blew through all the butter a lot faster than I was expecting to, which is something that absolutely happens in our house a lot, and I need to hop in the car and drive five minutes to the grocery store, there is inevitably going to be at least one child who wants to ride in the car with me. Now, in my flesh, in my desire to have a break for my kids, quite often how I feel about that is, oh, I was going to have five to seven minutes in the car of complete quiet, and I was going to be able to walk around the grocery store, maybe listening to a podcast or an audiobook, or maybe just 
having my thoughts be free and and uninterrupted by sweet chatter, but still chatter nonetheless. But instead, if I am able to say, okay, I would have had those things and those are not bad things and they are things that we definitely need as mamas. We need moments to reset and recharge. Most of the time though, I'm going to ask myself, is it more important that I recharge right now or is it more important that I connect with this child that it's asking to slip into the car with me and do this grocery run because they view it as a special treat? Most of the time I'm going to say yes to someone coming with me. And if it's someone that really wants to have just one-on-one -on -one time with mama, I will say, hey, okay, if you want to come with me, you're going to have to go get your shoes really quickly and like sneak into the car because you know everybody else is going to want to come too. That's not true. I, it's not that 10 want to come with me necessarily, but usually there's two or three others around the same age that say, oh, I want to go too. So sometimes we kind of make this this little secret trip that we jump in the car and go real quickly. Now, that is, is that glamorous? Is that the pony rides and cotton candy that the world tells us we need to do for it to be a memorable experience for our kids? The answer, of course, is no. But if I think back to my own childhood, um, and I've talked about the fact that I am one of two children, that I am four years younger than my brother. And so my mom, ostensibly, as a stay-at-home work at home, homeschool mama, definitely had enough time to divide between the two of us, one boy, one girl, four years apart, definitely had what the world would view as enough resources to make us feel seen, known, and loved. And she did do a good job of that. But the things that I remember are weren't grandiose gestures. Um, I do remember when she bought me a special gift. I do remember when she took me to a special place, but a lot of times it was these simple things. Like one of the main things that I remember that my mom and I used to do once I hit preteen or teenage age, and she and I were, um, becoming more friends than just mother and daughter was that she would take me to subway sometimes after we got finished with homeschool co-op that she taught and we would go and we would split a sandwich and we would split a Pepsi and we would split a bag of chips. We usually had coupons. That's how we afforded it because we just didn't have tons of extra money. And so I distinctly remember what that sandwich tastes like. That was not anything above and beyond or sparkly or a huge grand gesture. And yet I enjoyed it so much and looked forward to those times when we were able to sneak off together and do that. Or maybe sometimes we would go on a Goodwill run after we finished at Subway and because we both love thrifting. And we would take that time away together and it usually wasn't more than an hour or two at most and it didn't happen all that often, but I still distinctly have ingrained in me those memories of my mom taking that time to do things that I loved because she knew I loved them and because she enjoyed being with me. Um, so I know that my children will remember these grocery runs with me and they do the same thing with Sean. I know that they will remember the fact that I read aloud to them. Like I said, those moments with your two-year-old cuddled in your lap, even if you think this is what a good mom should do and therefore I am ticking a box and therefore it can't possibly count toward filling his love tank like I'm quote unquote supposed to, I strongly disagree. Those moments when they bring books to you and curl up in your lap are moments of connection that they may not specifically remember if they are very young, but they will definitely have a feeling of having been, um, of having been cuddled and loved and paid attention to. Um, another fun idea is to make a, um, a child or a couple of children your designated helpers for dinner in the evening. Um, you can have them help you chop, that you can have them help you stir. Now, I will say this, I am not OCD about kitchen mess. I don't love kitchen mess, but my idea is that you can always clean it up. And so I don't kick my children out of the kitchen very often. However, there are definitely times when I am tired and I just need to get dinner on the table and it is not a good day to have five-year-olds and seven-year-olds in there, you know, flipping the sauce with the spoon accidentally and dropping the eggs on the floor. So I absolutely know that while some of you are definitely cringing at the thought of all the extra work that having kids in the kitchen brings, and I get that. I also know that those days when we are able to say yes will be special to our kids. And not only that, but we're not just making a connection with their hearts, we're actually providing them with practical life skills that they can use going forward. And um, my second son, Simon, who's 15, is really quite a an accomplished little home chef at this point. I say little, he's six feet tall. Um, 
he is quite good. He has a knack for it and he's actually been by my side helping me cook since he was, pro he was probably about seven years old and he really enjoys it. And whenever he writes me Mother's Day cards, one of the things that he writes in there is thank you for teaching me how to cook. I really enjoy it. So the fact that a teenage boy would articulate that and without any prompting is proof that that's been something that has stuck with him, that he's grateful for the skill that he has going forward and that he's grateful for that time spent together. Um, Another suggestion would be, of course, to actually plan a little one-on-one -on -one date. Sometimes it can be very simple. My um, my younger boys, and, and I will point out that while I have often heard, especially from people who are disparaging about um, anybody that has more than one or two kids, they think three and up is ridiculous. You can't possibly be doing anything but kind of autopilot or zone defense, and you can't be making those connections, with which I completely disagree with. But if there's kind of this aggressive idea that if you're not in one-on-one -on -one contact with a child, they won't feel seen and loved, I also don't think that that's true. I think that in the case of a family that has several children who are close in age, a lot of times those children are bonded and they want to do things together with mama specifically. For example, both Theo and Honor, who are currently eight and six, who are little best buddies, love to go to this particular bookstore. And they don't love to go for the books. There's this little dinky toy section in the bookstore and that's what they love to go for. They love to look at the little toys and the puzzles and the stuffed animals. So when they ask for the bookstore, they really mean the toy store. And then right next door, there is a pet store and that is one-on-one -on -one date paradise for them. If we can go to the bookstore and the pet store and maybe go get a little treat, their little love tanks will be filled to the very, very brim. And not because they got to go just with mama by themselves, but because they got to go together, which they love and just with mama. So I think we need to be creative and receptive to the fact that our kids may not view one-on-one -on -one time or time of connection with them the same way that the world insists that it needs to look. Um, another idea is having a set day of the week where each child can pay, um, well, we use pennies from what we call our penny reward system and our kids accrue pennies through various things, either from when we've noticed that they have done something especially kind or helpful and we give them a penny without their knowing that it's coming. We just say, hey, that was really helpful. Thank you so much. Go put a penny in your jar. Or they can also earn pennies for things like um, learning a piano piece, learning um a chunk of poetry and reciting it for us, reading a book of a certain length. And so from their penny jar, they can use those pennies to do what we call stay up night at our house. And that is a set night of the week for two extra hours, up to two extra hours on, um, we've alternated between Friday and Saturday nights. Currently it's on Friday night, but that's just how it works in our family. And so they pay the, the pennies to do a special stay up night. Now, are we spending time with them for the rest of the week? Yes, of course we are. But that time of extra stay up time, something to look forward to and to use their pennies on is something that they really, really uh, get excited about. Another twist on that that I've seen, and I'll link our Penny Reward System ebook in the show notes today if you guys are interested in details about that or how that works because I've got it all kind of mapped out in the way that we do that and the list of things that they can redeem pennies for and things they can earn pennies for. It's been really helpful for our family. And twist on that that I've seen that I think is a great idea that has nothing to do with pennies or tokens or anything like that is the idea of having a rotating night where a particular child can stay up extra 15 minutes with mom and dad or whoever, you know, if dad has to work or mom isn't around to whatever parent is available to spend extra time with them that night. And, um, you just keep a schedule and you might not necessarily do it every single week. And sometimes it's just once a month, you get to stay up for an extra hour, but that's another way of finding a way to make your child feel special and unique and to focus love and attention specifically on that child so that they understand that they haven't been lost in the shuffle. Whatever number of kids you have that that shuffle looks like. Um, I mentioned the bigger one-on-one -on -one dates. We actually have a very specific uh, trip that we do with our kids when they turn 10. Um, and we take them on some trip or another. Sean takes the boys and I take the girls and uh, we only have three girls and they have all turned 10. So at this point, unless we have more girls in our future, I am actually done with this tradition, which makes me very sad because it is such a fun thing that we get to do. So for the boys, they love outdoorsy things. Sean has done this with Ezra and Simon so far. And then um, Theo will be coming up in a couple of years. 
and they've gone on camping trips and done outdoorsy things. The girls, we have gone to Dallas and stayed in a hotel and gone shopping and gotten pedicures and done all the girly things. And it's just such a unique and fun treat and something that they look forward to for years. Theo is literally planning his 10th birthday outing now and he has two years to go. So that's something that I feel like is a great way of um, establishing core memories for your kids of something bigger that they can look back on and say, our parents made this effort in this way. They made us feel seen by making it specifically about us on our 10th birthdays. And that it doesn't have to be a 10th birthday, of course. It could be any other age that you want it to be. People often ask whether uh, Evie and Nola, who just turned 10 this last September, want to do that together or if they would rather do it separately. And we just leave that up to them and they 100% want to do it together. We, they do the whole jump in the car and come to the grocery store with me separately or with Sean separately or do little dates with us separately. But for the most part, as identical twin girls, they enjoy spending their time together and they would feel like they were kind of missing their other half if we were to do it separately with them. Another thing that I really encourage parents to do is to be really transparent with their kids and willing to actually talk to them about this concept of what we can do, almost like a job performance evaluation to say, hey, do you feel like I've connected with you recently? Is there anything I can do better? Do you feel seen? What would fill your love tank more? What, what would you like to have more of in your future? Uh, how can I adjust? How can I show you just how much I love you? That may feel like a really vulnerable and scary thing to ask a kid, especially if we're in a really busy season and don't feel like we have the bandwidth to be as intentional. But I have found that when I take the time to just be open with the kids and say, hey, I have been feeling a little frazzled and run ragged lately. Do you feel like I am connecting with you still? Is there something else that I could do that they are so kind and so sweet to either say, you know what, mama, actually the other night when you let us stay up and um, sit on your bed and just chat with you while you were answering emails, even though your attention wasn't fully focused on us, the fact that you, we were just telling you stories and playing with your hair and we knew you had stuff to do, but we could just be there with you. That was a way of connecting with you. And we enjoyed that. Or the other day I had to sign all my kids up for their homeschool co-op and sign them up for all their classes. And with um, six or seven kids in that co-op, it takes a while to fill in all the forms. And I felt myself just feeling really stressed by filling in the name and the date and the, you know, the class and the teacher and the, just over and over and over again, very repetitive and very monotonous and felt like it was just taking a really long time because it was. And I had a child who was sitting beside me that wanted to play a game with me. And I had told him, buddy, I want to play with you, but if I don't get this done, I'm going to miss a deadline and they're asking me to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. If you can just sit with me and be patient, I will do it as fast as I can. Well, he sat with me for over an hour, just snuggled up at my side and he didn't complain. He just kind of asked me some questions about what I was doing. Why did we sign up for that? Who, who are you working on now? And I answered him as I went and when I asked him later, uh, I said, I'm sorry, buddy, that that took so long. He goes, oh, I didn't mind, mama. I like sitting beside you. So I think we can underestimate the power of just snuggling and holding our children and letting the, them be near us. I think we can underestimate the impact that not shooing our children away when we're stressed or when we have too much to do and instead welcoming them into our busyness when we're in an especially hectic season and being transparent with them and saying, this is what I'm dealing with right now. This is not going to be the most fun. I don't have a ton of free time in this, in the next week, but if we can get through the next couple of days, how about we do a pizza and movie night together as a family? How about we do extra read alouds and you guys can stay up a little bit later and we'll have some ice cream. How about we go for a walk, just the three of us? I think the opportunities to connect with our children are endless. And the last thing that I want to touch on is something that should be so obvious, but I find it is one of the most discounted ways of connecting with kids in our current culture, where a lot of our society says that kids should be free of responsibility and free of the need to kind of be on a trajectory toward maturity and adulthood, but instead kind of stay 
as kids footloose and fancy free for as long as possible. And they're going to be teenagers. We know that teenagers have cotton for brains. They can't be expected to do anything worthwhile. I don't agree with that narrative. I think that kids are very capable of learning and growing and maturing and gaining new skills. And when I was talking about how we live in a different culture and how the nuclear family looks different than it used to and how our schedules are so much fuller of different things than they used to be, and we feel so much more disconnected and we feel so much more frazzled, I think one of the things that we fail to acknowledge is that when we compartmentalize our lives to the point that we are saying, this is my work, I have to do the dishes, you be over there and let me work, and we push our children out of the realm of taking on household responsibilities and working alongside each other, we miss a really meaningful opportunity to build a bond of labor and and meaningful effort together as a family. If you think about Little House on the Prairie, for example, Laura Ingalls Wilder and her sisters and their parents working together in the fields or working together in the kitchen or working together around the house. One of the ways that they obviously had a bond together with a family was by understanding that each one of them was contributing meaningfully to their family's survival. And we have lost some of that because most of us are able to do a grocery pickup. Most of us don't have to build our own log cabin. Most of us are not looking at a uh, harvest where if it fails, we're going to be in a time of famine. And while I don't necessarily want to contemplate famine or whether the potatoes that we planted are going to help us make it through the winter or not, that's kind of not really on my radar of what sounds fun. I do think that we have lost an art of welcoming our children into meaningful contribution and meaningful connection and a meaningful bond that we develop by working together as a family. So I would just really encourage you in whatever way that you can just do regular life with your kids without overthinking, am I making enough of a connection? Do they feel loved? Do they feel seen? And instead say, how does God love and show me that I am seen and heard. And so much of that is just in the daily interactions. I talk to the Lord when I'm doing laundry. I pray about my kids when I am cleaning up the kitchen. We talk about meaningful things of the Lord. We memorize verses together. Those are all ways that I can show love to my Heavenly Father and feel His love in return. And we can model that and reflect that back to our kids, both in our intentionality and also just in our living life together. So if you feel overwhelmed by the prospect of loving your children well, by making sure that they all get what they need, I would encourage you to relax your jaw, to let your shoulders sink away from your ears, to take a deep breath and understand that the Lord is not asking you to run around like a chicken with your head cut off to take care of your family. There are days that feel that way, and there are always lots of things that need to be done, and I never feel like I get to all of them in any one day. But our children are not a checklist to be marked off to say, oop, spent time with Theo, spent time with Honor, made sure it was the same amount of time as I spent with Della today. Instead, there is going to be a natural ebb and flow to who has a little more need, a little more receptiveness even to attention, and it's going to kind of swirl and alternate and change from day to day with who comes and addresses me more and wants to spend more time with me and then who I notice needs a little more time with me where I can be intentional and reach out. I think you're doing a really good job today, Mama, as you look to the Lord for your strength and look to your kids for a way of showing them just how much your Heavenly Father loves you and how much He loves them and how much you love them as well. I hope you guys feel encouraged and energized today to just keep on being a mama that loves the Lord and loves her children well. If you guys enjoyed today's program, I would be so honored if you would subscribe and share with others. And if you're looking for more daily content on motherhood and biblical responses to cultural issues, you can follow along on Instagram at m.is.4.mama.